welcome back to Time Limit. I'm really excited to jump right into my interview with Daniel Stillman. Daniel is an independent design facilitator. So he works with clients and organizations of all shapes and sizes, basically to help them frame and sustain productive and collaborative conversations, to deepen their facilitation skills, and then he does some coaching around the innovation process. I'm so happy to have connected with Daniel um, and to talk to him about his new book, Good Talk, How to Design Conversations That Matter. We'll jump right into the conversation and talk about conversation. It was a really fun one for me because like Daniel says, human beings are conversational animals and we live our lives one conversation at a time. I think you'll enjoy the conversation and find a few helpful tips to keep all of your conversations productive and helpful. So check it out. Daniel Stillman, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for making the time to chat with me today. Appreciate you being here. Brett, thanks for making this happen. It yeah. wasn't easy. <laughs> it wasn't easy. We had to be easy. committed to making time. It's hard to make time in life sometimes. It's really weird that we're trapped in our homes, but we still are having a hard time to find time. Right? Yeah, I don't know all these people who have like you know got extra time to take on a new hobby. Um, yeah, I'm I know with you that's, on that. that's that's reality for a lot of people, but it's it's. Somebody actually dropped in on a, on, a, on a Zoom call with me today. I don't know if this has ever happened to you. I know I'm, I'm like veering the conversation already, but literally he invited I, – I was suddenly saw a pop-up like with Skype where somebody was inviting me to a Zoom call. He dropped in on me. Nobody oh. does that anymore. I had a no. drop in. Everything is so tightly planned. Yeah. And so I think this is actually something interesting to unpack at some point. Like we can still have that in this digital place, that, that uh, impromptu can. gathering. Yeah, I guess I typically just do that via Slack, not with like a drop-in call. Like I would never assume yeah. that someone's just ready to to see me or to be right. seen, really. <laughs> right, right, right. So texting is, is polite in my world and calling is rude. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like the it's like the drop-in, right? Like you don't want somebody to just drop by your house at, at with no notice. That's funny. Right. But some people also still feel like you know a Slack message in the middle of the night is like doesn't don't they know that I'm. You know, because yeah. they I have to respond, but do we? It's very true. I say no, you don't, especially right. in the middle of the night or any time during the day. It's up to you. Do what you want. So with we're your, already, your I mean, this is already conversation design, right? We're already talking about like it is. how do we prefer our conversations to be architected? Where and when would we like them to happen? And when are they appropriate? When do we feel like they're appropriate or inappropriate? And people come to blows over these things, which is like, I can't believe he slacked me in the middle of the night. Ugh. This Did you architect this whole intro to the the podcast interview? <laughs> no, just we just <laughs> everything's about conversations for me. So that's just it's a natural segue, no matter what. <laughs> it's so funny. So all right, so just to kind of give our listeners a little context before we just go on this kind of like thirty minute talk of rambling, um, we're going to talk <laughs> about your new book, which is coming out really yeah. soon, and it's called Good Talk. Yeah, and it's all about conversation design. Um, I think that term conversation design is definitely a little bit new to me. I also feel like uh, in the digital industry that I come from, that you're in, it feels like a lot of things are turned into to design, including meeting mm-hmm. design. And, and you know, yep. I'm curious, where did that term come from and, and kind of what drew you to it? Yeah. Well, so let's like, let's talk about design first because it means so many things to so many people I went to school for industrial design at Pratt and Pratt has this like Bauhaus heritage. And so we spent an entire semester literally studying negative space. And another class we talked about whether curves were fast or slow, right? So we were really thinking about design from this granular level. And I feel like we have all been in this era growing up with design rapidly changing what it is. And this is the classic Steve Jobs quote. I I don't like quoting Steve Jobs because I think it's generally agreed upon that he was a jerk. But (laughs) that said, he talks, there's that quote about design isn't how it looks, it's how it works. And I feel like we've grown up from design being, especially in the 80s and 90s, where it was just about form. Mm-hmm. to where it was about functionality and it's about brand and it's about experience. 
And so for me, particularly, I when I got into industrial design, as soon as I got in to working at a consultancy on the research and strategy side, it's like, oh, well, actually, industrial design is dead. Nobody told me. Uh, it had its heyday in the 50s. And everything we were designing had a screen. Interesting. And somebody else was designing what happened on that screen. And all of the action was happening on the screen. So I was touring this, the country, interviewing people about the future of home theater. And we were talking about speaker location and how they installed it and what height they put the TV and how could we design the bezel so beautifully and how could we make it so that it was easy for people to set up their home theater and trying to like understand that. And guess what? Somebody else was designing the... Uh, what was called I, internet protocol television systems on the television. We're like, oh my God, we're going to all this trouble to design this television and nobody's looking at the television, <laughs> right? <laughs> they're, they're, right? And so my boss was like, what is this thing? We're losing this other half of the business. We're not designing the total experience for this product. And so we started trying to win what were then called interaction design projects. Yeah. Right? So I, as soon as I got out of industrial design school, like everyone's like, Psst, have you heard about interaction design kid? And I'm like, Ooh, tell me about that. And you're like, <laughs> well, and I was like, wait a minute, this is really just a lot like industrial design because industrial designers think about interaction. Like any good industrial designer thinks about the unboxing of the product, right? Right. You think about all the videos you watch of un people unboxing their, their favorite products. Right. And so to me, experience design was this next type of design that popped up along the pathway. So I'm going from like 2007 to 2008 and 2009. And people are like, well, it's actually experience design. No, no, it's customer experience design. No, it's all services. Everything is services. We're selling the products just in, uh, uh, are just disintermediating services. And so the, without the brain and without the service, like what is your phone? Your phone's not a product. Like you buy the phone, but uh, it's connected to a universe of services. And so right. there's all these people who are like, no, 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 it's service design. And if you really want to understand what you're doing, you have to unpack services. There's people, places, props, partners. I forget what the last P is. And so there's all these this language that we have around what it is that we're doing. And you could just say, oh, well, it's just somebody selling their consultancy services um, deeper into an organization. And if I was cynical, Brett, I would agree with you. But I think new language helps you describe things better. Service design definitely gave us designers new eyes. And it allowed industrial designers to take their fundamental skills of thinking about people and customers, all stakeholders, process and impact and saying, like, how do I stretch this out? and really make something that matters. And so for me, one of the things that I realized when I got into, and this is a long tirade, so stop me anytime, but no, it's uh, great. when I got into this, the consultancy world, when I started working at a design agency, I think what I thought was, as many designers do, I just have to make something good. And what I really had to do is I had to design this whole process to bring my uh, clients along with me. I don't think I had the language for it, but what I was doing was designing conversations. Mm -hmm. I was designing these workshop experiences to extract information from them or to incept information into their heads. And so this is like designing for and then designing with. And it wasn't until much, much later I started teaching design thinking to non-designers because I thought like I had this idea of like, well, design thinking is the stuff I learned after design school. So anybody can do it. And if we all know the language of design thinking, we can all like we can play better together. I don't have to explain everything to my clients every time we're doing it. And we can play this game called innovation and they'll be along the ride with me. A group I worked with in 2015 called their facilitative practice conversation design, and it really insulted me when I first heard it because I was like, you're not designers, and what is that? That's gross. <laughs> Honestly, that was I was like, that's kind of douchey, but it really tickled my brain, and I was like, well, what does it mean to design a conversation, and what is the material of conversation? I literally I sat down and I did four interviews with um, some people I, I, I know and respect. I was like, well, is this the next type of design? You know, going through like all of those phases I'd gone through in my career, I was like, is this what we need to be aware of as designers? 
is this the language we need to be able to describe what we're actually doing? Because I'd been thinking about workshop design and facilitation as experience design. Cause like you get a bunch of people in a room and you design an experience for them. And so I was using the language of experience design to teach people about designing better workshops. Okay. And so this idea of like, well, what are we doing when we design a workshop or a meeting? Well, I think it's like, what's really problematic for me is that people look at, they want blog posts of tips as if tips will tell you how to do it. Like I can, it's like writing, it's as if reading an essay about playing a guitar can help you shred. <laughs> right. And so I think there's stuff about designing conversations that there's like tips and tricks. And then there's this other thing of just like, can you feel, can you feel conversation as a material in the same way that we've started to think about products and services and experiences as materials that we have to shape and we, and we, we mold them and we try to make them work. And so if we want to critique a product, a service, or an experience, we have a language for it. If we want to critique a, a meeting or a workshop or a conversation or a dialogue or a process, we have almost no language for it. And so a lot of the book is just me uh, scraping around the universe for language. I will now pause. <laughs> that was the whole no. thing. That's everything. It's really interesting. I mean, so I read the preview of the book on Amazon. And in that preview, you tell a story about an experience that you had that kind of got you into this topic when you, I guess, mm -hmm. when you, when you were in that research job. Yeah. Um, and I, I think it's really interesting because what you're doing from what I can see is you're kind of, you know, conversation is something that we all do, like every, every right. person, right? Yes. Um, and so what I think you're doing really well is kind of, bringing your kind of two worlds together, right? Like your work world and your home world. And you're kind of relating the topic around both um, mm -hmm. and making it relevant to anyone. Um, one of the questions that you kind of posed earlier was like, what does it mean to design a conversation? And I'm just yeah. curious, you know, you talked about framing conversations for workshops or around feedback or around like really specific scenarios that you can kind of plan for. Yeah, it does. Conversation des design relate to the day to day. Oh yeah, I mean totally, a hundred percent. Okay, I, I think it part of it has to do with like your feel for the the thing. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. So like, it, I tried to describe what I thought the levers of conversation design were. Like, what what were the fundamental pieces? Although it's like pretty much impossible to like agree on this is what it is. And like when I submitted it, you know, a, a fourth draft to my publisher, he was like, wait, these three things feel like they're one thing. I'm like, well, they're different. And so one of the things is like cadence, like what's the pace or the, like the, the musicality of the conversation. And that's just something I've become more, more aware of. And in that, I think in the example you're talking about is like me interviewing somebody and we all know this experience when, you ask them a question and they give you a, an answer and there's a moment where they pause. And then, uh, I, I started thinking I had to ask my next question because I was aware of time. I had other stuff I wanted to learn. And the, the person I was interviewing and I started speaking at the same time. And what, what that is, is, uh, like a, a conversational collision. That's an error. Error is something that happens in every conversation. We like, we, we, we collide. And what, what, what happens is you're like, Hey, what were you? Oh no, wait, what were, what, what were you going to say? And, and then you're like, Oh, I can't remember now. And I was like, ah, oh, geez, I destroyed her half of the conversation because I, my cadence, my pace was too fast. Right. Mm -hmm. And we've, we, you know, we've definitely, I feel like this is a Seinfeld episode. Like there's a slow talker episode. It's like, he's a slow talker. Right. There's some people <laughs> who just like talk slow and they're okay with bigger pauses. But generally we only allow like a 200 millisecond gap between when one person speaks and another speaks. This is actually a, a, from what I've read fairly consistent off across many cultures and even like with sign language conversations, like we want somebody to feel heard and we want to be responsive. And so we respond, but here's what's weird. And this is why we talk about the material of conversation. It takes approximately 600 milliseconds 
to form a thought of what you're going to say. So if you do the math, if when Brett stops talking and in 200 milliseconds I respond and it takes me 600 milliseconds to formulate a response, then one of two things is happening. Either I'm speaking total like garbage, right? Because I'm like speaking with half a brain, right? Mm -hmm. Like if I open my mouth in 200 milliseconds after you start, you stop talking, that means that my, what I'm, and this is why people say, um, or, uh, you know, like, wow, that's interesting. So I'm either saying something that's, that's total garbage, or I've started thinking about what I was going to say, uh, 400 milliseconds before you stopped. It's right? really interesting. Yeah. I mean, so I am that guy. I feel like every day when I'm in a zoom call or a Google hangout or whatever service we're using, there is an issue with people jumping on some, what someone else said. And I yes. feel, and you feel so terrible when you cut someone off because you want their, Yes. Uh, their thought to kind of be completed and, and give them the space and time to do that. But if there's like a long pause, it feels awkward. Yes. And if you have yes. a thought, you're just naturally going to jump in. So are, yeah. are there, do you have any tips around like how you should handle <laughs> that situation? Yeah. Well, so, I mean, and this is, so this is, and again, this is the, this is the thing I was talking about where there's like, um, there's ways of doing like, mm-hmm. so I can give you, there's ways I can say like, oh, well, just wait more. But the willingness to wait more, the doing requires different ways of being, which is not to say you have to be different or we all need to be different than we are. But it, it, in order to actually leverage the tools, we have to change our approach. And that right. this is the problematic. And this, this is behavior change and culture change in general. If I just say to like a, a company that's having like, or a team that's having issues, well, just be nice to each other, guys. <laughs> right? And they're like, that well, works. how? And I'm like, well, just just be nice. This is like your mother. Like, why can't you two just get along? I don't get it. <laughs> right? And so if I just say, well, Brett, just like let get everyone to agree that it's okay that silence is all right. Now you can actually do that. So this is the thing that's funny. I, I read an article, like if you Google... Um, the types of meetings, I'm, I'm, you know, there's lots of classification systems for this. Atlassian had this amazing article where they were like, here are the six types of meetings that your your team should always have. And the one that they never should, like total awesome clickbait title. <laughs> and the one that they never should was the meeting about meetings. And I was like, oh, my God, that's the meeting everybody needs to have. You need to have at least one meeting about your meetings. I don't know, not every week. That's too much. And so now we're talking about cadence again. How often, Brett, do you think a team or an organization should have a meeting about meetings? Well, that's a, that's a tough question because I, I think it depends on what that team is doing, what they're willing to do. It has a lot to do with the kind of culture of the team and the preference of the team. Yeah. So I think even getting the team to decide that cadence would be mm-hmm. fine. And this, but then again, this is also my, my way of like, cause I, I come at it from a coach coach's perspective. I don't mm-hmm. want to give people best practices because I actually think that inhibits their free will and their learning. And that's based on my own belief that, um, people are most motivated when they feel they have the most power and agency. And that's based on my understanding from like the conversation OS, like power is an element in the conversation operating system. Like when, when people feel they have power, they will take it. Alice Walker said that the the I always misquote her. I really should learn how to quote Alice Walker better. But the <laughs> the the way that most people give up their power is by believing that they have none. And it's a it's a real challenge. Like everyone on the team, if we're saying like, wow, Brett's team, we want to have more deep, interesting, useful, effective conversations. How might we do that? Right. What are some things? What are some challenges we're seeing? And what are some things that we would like to do? Uh, what are some things we could try? Right? What are some things that we're willing to try? And then we could start having a conversation about what experiments could we do week on mm-hmm. week to say like, oh, well, that that was interesting. But there's some basics. I will indulge your desire for tips, Brett. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> one of the things that like, and, and, and a lot of us in this in this game talk about this, like it's really, really basic stuff. And it's kind of embarrassingly basic. Like if you do a check-in, a 30 second check-in where everyone shares one thing, it kind of sets the stage that everyone will share. Mm-hmm. Um, it's also just establishing that like silence is okay. Third, 
active listening, and maybe this was just on my mind because I, I, the email I sent out to my my newsletter today was about active listening. To me, the the 400, 600, 200 millisecond problem, this four, this this essential gap we have, I feel like everybody's got a different approach. That when somebody speaks, we can either um, react. Oh, I love that. I don't love that. Right. Or we can reflect. Oh, what I heard was this. Is that right? Active listening is a really generous way of being like, wait, so Brett, it sounds like you're saying this. Is that right? And you go, yes. And you, is there anything else? Oh, yeah, this. It's deeply listening to somebody and really giving them space to share what they're going to share. But we get impatient. And so that's right. like, I can tell you that to do more active listening, but that's a way of doing that's great. But our way of being is like, we only got 30 minutes for this call. I worked with a global um, uh, a PR firm where they were like talking about having better brainstorms. And I was like, well, let's talk about like what your average brainstorm is like. And they're like, it's like 30 minutes and there's like 15 <laughs> people. And I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> like these are tough design constraints. Yeah. These are hard design constraints. And I'm like, well, so we can do the classic everybody think alone and think together. And I can recommend that people come with ideas and do pre-work. But that's a fantasy, right? The the culture won't allow people to take 15 minutes to do some silent, reflective brainstorming before they get into that 30 meeting. Because there were another 30-minute meeting, meeting before that 30-minute meeting. Right, right. And so then we start thinking about design, right, where it's like, well, I'd like to design this meeting better, but there's all these other layers of design around it that have already been established for me by mm -hmm. the culture, mm -hmm. right? And so yeah. I'm, I'm hemmed in. I, I, can, I have to design a 30-minute meeting that works as a self-contained, effective unit when people will be five minutes late to it. <laughs> And then, right, they're going to be five minutes late. And then it feels like a lot of times, especially when the culture is not great, you get into that 30 minute meeting and it's derailed within the first five minutes by that person not showing up or that person coming in and just completely doing different business than what was intended in the first place. Right. And so you're this always is, going to be met is, with challenges, right? I mean, it's, right, right. Right. And this has to do with inviting the right people and doing the pre-work. And so when I talk about conversation design, um, the conversation starts much earlier than we think. And, and, in, and in the experience design framework that I know and love the, the five E's of experience design, entice, enter, engage, exit, and extend. I often like to teach people like at least two layers of there's, there's many layers of designing a conversation. But if you think about the experience of the conversation, they are being enticed to enter and engage way, way upstream and the experience. It's not – the meeting doesn't start at uh, 9.05 when everyone finally shows up. It started when you sent the invitation. And I think right. it actually even started even before that. It started when you incepted the idea of the thing and decided what you thought was possible. Interesting. And then I guess it kind of proceeds if there's an agenda, right? If there's an, a meeting agenda, then there's a little bit of an expectation around what the conversation is and how it will kind of flow. Yeah. And agendas are just like even the like like uh, what I would call like level zero of conver of designing a meeting. Right. Because mm -hmm. most agendas are not realistic. They don't have buffer time and they don't have a process associated with them. Like, how will you get those people to talk about that item? Will we talk? We'll we'll just talk about it. Well, everybody, what do we think? And then what happens? Somebody speaks first. Usually um, often it's a guy um, who, whoever feels empowered to kick off the conversation is going to be somebody who thinks out loud, uh, is extroverted, mm -hmm. right. And, uh, is, is habitually accustomed to feeling comfortable to, uh, sharing their thoughts. It's not going to be somebody who's introverted. It's not going to be somebody who's, uh, uh, further down the totem pole. It's not necessarily going to be this, the person who knows the most about the problem necessarily, Whoever speaks first, if we say, so we've got to, we've got to solve, uh, this scheduling issue. Um, what are some ideas, right? And this is just brainstorm design. I mean, there's tons of rules for brainstorms. The first one is just think quietly before you let everyone think their own thoughts before we think together. Amazing news flash. Remote meetings are actually better for this stuff. Um, 
Clarence Thomas, Supreme Court Justice, has asked more questions in the remote <laughs> in the remote uh, hearings of the Supreme Court in the last month than he has asked in the last like five years. Fascinating. Like, it is fascinating. So like remote meetings, because there's no table, you know, this is so space is something that defines the conversation, right? Mm -hmm. You know, those, it's like that classic image. I, I think it's maybe it's the first Batman movie where like, he's got a super duper long table and uh, Michael Keaton is as, as Bruce Wayne is all the way on one table side of the table. And is it Kim Bassinger? Kim Bassinger is all the way on the other side of the table. And like, they have to like shout down to each other from like either i don't know if you remember the movie but i'm vaguely you know, remembering like, this yeah but you get the, you get the scene like yes, we're having absolutely. intimate dinner 20 feet apart at either right. ends of the table this is silly like when i go out with my fiance back when we could go out to restaurants i actually loved sitting on the same side or caddy corner i hate sitting opposite from them and sometimes she'd be like wait what like I want to look at you. I'm like, yeah, I want to be closer to you. And I want to be looking at the same thing with you. And you step mm -hmm. into a room, the room says something about what's going to happen. And so when we step into a digital space, there's no person at the head of the table who's going to kick things off. There's no, there's no order implied, which is hard, but also allows Clarence Thomas to feel like he can contribute. So amazing. It's exactly interesting. Yeah. yeah. It, let, it, it allows space for people with different personality types. It's almost like a, a level set in some ways. Yeah. Everyone's and that's equal. designing for, that's designing for different people, which, which, yeah. which we have to do all the time. We can't just design a product or a service or an experience. We, even though we say, oh, here's our ideal persona, the reality is we have three or four or five or a broad swath of people. And we have to just design these conversations that we're designing for the people who have to use them. Right. right? For the diversity of uh, neurological and sociological uh, abilities that people have so that we can get the best contributions. Absolutely. I, mean, I talk a little bit about that in, in some of the classes at Team Gantt around kind of communication tactics and just being aware of the people that you're working with and the communicator right. types you're working with and making adjustments for those people so that your communication lands well and you and the team get what you need out of those people and your interactions to make sure that everything is running kind of successfully. Because at the end of the day, if you're not communicating well with someone, they're not going to deliver for you, right? Or they're not going to deliver right. what was expected if they don't really understand what that should be. I think right. kind of um, along those lines, you know, project managers specifically are always faced with difficult conversations. Yes. You know, they could be surrounding things like a missed deadline, scope overages, or, you know, other kind of mm -hmm. like interpersonal conflicts. I'm thinking that these are maybe topics that in the book you kind of refer to as the conversations we won't have. You know, yeah. like you'll, you'll come to a... a a tough situation and you, you have to address it and addressing it with that person is sometimes like, it feels like it's the end of the world, right? Yeah. It's the last thing you want to do with your day. You don't want to further ruin your day, ruin that person's day. I'm, I'm wondering like, what's your kind of overall thinking or guidance around how to address those difficult conversations? Yeah, it's really challenging. And I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. uh, I'm coaching a design leader right now about some of the stuff. And one of the things that I'm noticing in my conversation with him is that there's upstream versus downstream conversations. So he's, he's up against somebody who's, you know, you know, when you're working on a complex project, it's hard to define what done is. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to define. If it's hard to know what done is, it's hard to know what halfway done is because this is a really complex, uh, challenge that they're solving for their organization, but he really wants to be able to trust this person to self-manage because they're an intelligent person and wants them to really be able to activate themselves. And so if he comes to them, he's starting to feel itchy and he's like, where, where are they with this? Right. And when you have that itchy feeling of where are they with this, this is, this is, this is his cadence coming in. This is like, Brett, will you get to the point? Where are you going with this question? Mm -hmm. Right. Or I can say, oh, that's an interesting question, Brett. Like, tell me more. And that's, you know, patience versus 
anxiety. So he's got to manage himself because the, if he comes to this person and says, hey, so we're halfway, where are you with this? It can actually make her um, recede in the conversation. Right. right? Mm -hmm. And it's a very delicate thing to say, hey, where do you, th where do you think we should be on this? Right? Where, where would you like to be with this right now? Now, we're in a conversation where we may not have established where we should be when we should be. So if you're a great project manager or, or a product manager and you can define really good uh, touch points and goalposts that everyone's actually aligned on, then it's not so much of a hard conversation because we've made agreements and everyone's right. bought into the agreements. So and it takes that feeling of like the personal attack out of it in some way, right? Because right. like, that's what right. that's what why people have a negative reaction to that kind of thing. Because it is a personal question. So like, where are you on this? There's an expectation on you about something, and I need to know in this moment. Like that's how it feels when you get asked a simple question like that. Yes, and so this is where um, there's this polarity between asking and telling. Mm -hmm. That is really amazing, and. This polarity came to me. There's a book called uh, Humble Inquiry by Ed, Edgar Schein. Um, and I'm going through it very slowly, but he, just think about that spectrum. Am I asking or am I telling? You're late on this deliverable versus like, where should we be with this deliverable? Where where did you think we would be with this deliverable? What can we do to move this deliverable forward? How can mm -hmm. we make sure this doesn't happen the next time? Right? And this idea of humble inquiry, I think, is so important. This I, I think we think like, oh, I have to have this difficult conversation because I need to let this person know that they're letting me down and they're screwing up. Mm -hmm. But that's a way, way downstream question. We may not be there. You may feel like you're there, right. but we may not be there yet. And the 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 idea is to really get to what's happening, what the real problems are. And so there's another axis. This is not Ed Schein's book. Um, I think it's David Rock in Quiet Leadership talks about this. I use this now. It's like asking versus telling and problem versus solution. And so this is another way to design your, your conversations. What quadrant am I playing in and why? It's totally fine to tell somebody what the problem is. If it's a real emergency, you're like, Brett, you're late with the deliverable. I need to know what's going on. Right. Mm -hmm. That's telling somebody what the problem is and then asking them, right, what, what, what's going on. And that's very different than saying like, Brett, we're late on the deliverable. You always do this. That's telling and tell that's double telling. And that's going to make somebody feel bad. Like Brett, you're late with the deliverable. You have too much on your plate right now, don't you? Right. That's, that's double telling again. Right. And so I think the best, I mean, this is just me personally. And also I'm an idealist and I don't have a real job. So don't take any advice from me. These are principles that people should live by. But I, <laughs> I believe that we should be gentle with people and with each other. And so asking people about the problems that they're facing is much more gentle than telling them about the problems that they're facing. Right. It's also a little bit leading too, right? I mean, if you yeah. say, you're, you're late with this thing. You've got too much work on your plate. Like that's yeah. right away well, giving that person the excuse that they think that you expect them to give, whether that's yes. the, the case or not. Yeah. And it's leading and not in the good way of leading. Cause really right. asking somebody like really asking, double asking or at, you know, playing gently in that quadrant is really leading somebody to be able to deliver more. Hey, where did you, I, I thought we were going to be further along with this. What was your understanding? And right. if you actually come humbly, you know, hey, look, I may not have, we may not have established this clearly, but I, I'm feeling a little nervous. And so mm -hmm. this is where we have to, what's, what's difficult about these conversations is that we don't want to make someone feel bad because we feel bad. But we right. need to be okay with like, I don't feel comfortable about this. Brett, I'm, I'm a little confused. I'm feeling conflicted. I honestly thought we'd be further along. I could be wrong. No, dude, you're right. I'm really sorry. Totally blew the pooch on that one. You're yeah. Like, okay, cool. That's coming in uh, not hot, right? That's coming in smooth. And not for nothing, I think it's a more relational way of, of working. Absolutely. And that's so important in project management too, right? It's like 
when you can show someone that you care about them as an individual, not just about their work product and checking up on where those things are and not putting them on the spot in a negative yeah. way, but showing them that like you could have misunderstood something or you yes. understand that they're behind and you just need to figure out why and how you can kind of fix it. That builds trust and that long term makes yeah. teamwork a lot easier. Now, here's the thing. Uh, if you don't write your com things down, it didn't happen. Conversations have a place. Conversations have like our conversations happening in Skype right now. That's mm -hmm. the interface for a conversation. And it's different than in Zoom. Right. I've got I can right. I can send you emojis. I can send you a slow clap emoji, which is just hilarious. Which you just did. <laughs> which I just <laughs> did. And that's a different these the, the affordances in design we talk about this like the affordances of this interface allow a different type of conversation to happen mm -hmm. and uh ha giving the conversation a good place to happen is so transformative and this is and i've had conversations about this one of my first companies i feel like we had constant battles of like i wanted to be on asana and somebody else wanted to be on Trello or pipe drive and somebody else just didn't want to use anything. <laughs> <laughs> like we're three partners and we all wanted to use different tools to manage uh, our process. Right. I'm not saying that like, you know, this, you know, monday.com, just like go there. It'll solve all your problems. That's not true either. But if you like, this is where an interaction design, we're like, Oh, well, here's the customer journey map. Here's where we started. Here's where we, we want to get to. Here's where we are now. Where should we be? If you don't have a record of your agreements, it's really hard to hold them, hold people yeah. to them. Yeah, that's a really good point. I, and, you know, I was actually going to ask you um, how much of this, like what we're talking about, it, it to me, it applies still to that written conversation. Like, of course, I oh, love yeah. the idea of having some kind of record of what's discussed in person. Um, but the way that you would handle that written conversation, be it over email, through your project management app, over Slack or chat, <laughs> right. like, yeah, this is, gosh, it's like, uh, that's like a whole other can of worms. It feels yeah, like, written, I mean, written conversations are conversations. My, my friend just sent me a picture and sorry for talking over where you're going to no, go you're good. He, he, there was a picture of a, of, um, a bomb, like coming out of a, a an air fighter, and on the bomb, it said, as per my previous email, I'll just let that joke soak in there. But it's like <laughs> that that phrase is incendiary. It's like, yeah. as per my previous email, which you clearly didn't re read, you right. idiot. Yeah, it's you're like you're reading between that. the lines. Yeah, yeah, we can all know read between the lines. And I, I had that with somebody last night where they they um they were uh, they were like, oh, I can't come to the I'm going to be 30 minutes late to uh the workshop tomorrow. I was like, oh, thanks for letting me know. And that thanks for letting me know was a double entendre. And she picked up both <laughs> meetings. <laughs> I was like, yeah, thank you for it's... letting me know. And thanks for letting me know. She's like, well, I would have let you know in the morning. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not even going to respond to that second email. Yeah. Um, there's nothing to respond to. Yeah. It's this thing too, where, and I don't know if you've experienced this, but some by people, the way, she's a wonderful person. I'm, I'm, you know, she, yeah, she listens to this. Like, thing. I mean, it's, it, I, I, but it's like I have my own operating system when it comes to like when somebody shows up too late to a workshop, I still have to manage myself. Right. So I'm like, this trifling so and so has the nerve. You know, here I am pouring my guts out on the stage, and right. they are five minutes late. <laughs> oh. Well, <gasps> I mean, it's it also has to do with when that message hit you. And what you were doing and the context yeah. around that, right? I mean, it's very and, different from how you yeah. would have that conversation in person. You'd be like, right. oh, I'm sorry to hear that, you know, and then she might right. it'd tell you why. And then and then it would be like, no big deal at all. But right. I, I think the thing about written communication, too, is that some people just feel like when they're at work, they have to use formal language that feels like business language. And this is the way yeah. I should communicate to you. And it often feels terse or dry and maybe just a little unfriendly. Um, yeah. So, I, yeah. you know, to me, I, I feel like that's where you can definitely people can kind of make some adjustments and read back through an email or a message and say, is this how I would yes. actually say this thing in person? And if it's yeah. not, then rewrite it or edit it.
Yeah, and take a paragraph out. I just read um, a series of posts. There were there were images of like whiteboard captures from inside Amazon of how they speak, and so they were like, "Here are the three Amazon answers to a question." Um, yes. No. Yes, I don't. Yes, no, I don't know a number or I'll find out. I forgot what it was. It's like there was this extremely limited. It's like it does. It, will this work? Yes. No, <laughs> I don't know. Here's what I'll find out or percent percent clarity. It was just like, wow, this is they're really clarifying their culture. It's right. not like, well, it might. It's like, no, it's either yes or no or you don't know. You'll find out when, or here's a probability. Like, that's it. Those are the, well, I mean, yes, but it kind of, I, to me, it's funny. My my thing was like, oh, well, isn't that simplifying? Isn't that useful? Like, they don't want somebody to, to have weasel words or hedge language. Like, mm. well, you know, we we think this, or we, it might that. It's like, it's not about convincing me. It's like, do you have evidence or not? Like, let's just be clean about it. Right. Yeah, I guess it sets an expectation around how you would um, kind of operate or communicate about your work or decisions around your work. And that's certainly helpful. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so we're coming up on time and I appreciate yeah. you so much. Like th this has been a, a fun conversation for me. Thank you. Um, me too. So as you know, the show is called <laughs> Time Limit. At the end of every episode, <laughs> I kind of just ask my interviewees, if they might be able to offer a couple of tips or even just like a scenario where you've kind of related to something. So I'm kind of keeping with the theme of having limits on, on time and resources. I'm wondering if you have any conversation or facilitation tips or ta tactics that our listeners can utilize when they're stretched for time and they just, you know, mm. project managers a lot of times just need to get decisions made. They need to help push a team to make progress and get work done sometimes really quickly with not yes. enough resources yeah. and with less debate and less conversation. Are there yes. any things that you might recommend that kind of uh, conversationally help to push those things along? Yes. So one of my favorite tools as a facilitator is lying about time. Uh, you know, you know, and certainly in a workshop setting, I love telling people that they have five minutes for a task mm -hmm. when it's an absurd amount of time for the task. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, let's put together the thing in five, and, and five minutes and then letting people sweat it out. And then when there's um, four, when there's a minute left, ask them if they need an extra minute. And everyone will need an extra minute because if five minutes isn't enough time, four minutes is definitely not enough time. Uh, <laughs> so this is one of the reasons why I actually don't like time timers because they're, they, they force you to be honest about time. So if I'm the timekeeper and I'm the time friend, I can say, all right, everybody. So like, let's write down, you know, five solutions that we think are really going to blah, 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 this blah, 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 by blah, blah, blah. And they go, okay, cool. So we're already given them a time limit, right? time limits and time boxing, time constraints will get people to generate five ideas in five minutes is a lot. Mm -hmm. And so then I, I lie, you know, at four minutes, I give them that extra minute and they're like, Oh, that's great. Thank you. I feel so much more relaxed with that extra minute. So I'm just giving them back a minute that was theirs anyway. And then I tell them at the end, towards the end, you know, maybe with the last 30 seconds, I'm like, if you only have two or three, that's fine. And then I say like, you know what, actually just share your top two ideas and they're like oh okay cool so they look at their five ideas and they're like well these are the two that are the really the best and so uh then we just see everybody's ideas i mean this is mm -hmm. again this is not revolutionary facilitation mechanics but lying about time stretching time reducing what people getting people to already edit what they're sharing with the group so getting people to generate more and then giving mm -hmm. only the best when there's a big decision to be made I like getting everyone to write down what they think, especially if we think that there's a big gap between where we are and where we need to be. Mm -hmm. You know, put those ideas up there on the wall. And it can be a virtual wall or, you know, a digital whiteboard wall or a, a, a whiteboard wall. But put those I put 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 it up there. And for me, I think that gives us a sense of where we are. What's the distance between where where we where we are now and where we need to be i think a lot like of people that. are afraid yeah. i think people are often afraid to do that because 
well, what if we are further apart than right. I want us to be, right? But what I found is um, seeing the distance is always better than not seeing the distance, right? Knowing the gap is better than not than guessing at the gap. And once we know the distance between everybody, we start to move our opinions around on the wall and we say, oh, well, we've got these three opinions. We can say to the person in the minority, how do you feel? Can you agree? This is designing how we decide, right? Deciding mm -hmm. about how we decide. Mm -hmm. What does it mean for one person to disagree? Can you disagree and commit? That's the classic phrase. Can you disagree and commit? Or... Uh, do we need to get evidence about these two or three different pathways? But now we can actually have the conversation about what's next. And before we were just nervous. Yeah, I, those are really great tips. I think a lot of times folks get into a meeting where they might be the de facto facilitator and just think like, oh, we're just going to have this conversation. But I think with what you kind of just outlined, if that person remembers what the goal is for that meeting, yeah. And they're driving at meeting those goals and whether it's getting people to write things out and discussing them as a group or if it's doing an exercise and getting, you know, the top couple of ideas out of someone, that's going to yeah. basically drive a more productive conversation. Absolutely. Um, and it'll save you time from kind of spinning wheels and having a conversation where you go round and round and round in the room. You just yes. go directly into getting the ideas out and having a more productive conversation right away. So yeah, because really otherwise helpful. it can be a ping pong match, and now all we have is let's 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 all sit around the fire. Right. Of the Where's their consensus, the or where are yeah. we really far apart? Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. If cool. if everybody's opinion matters, which is right, not. depending on your meeting and the attendees. Yeah. Well, Daniel, thank you so much for joining me on Time Limit. Again, I hope everyone checks out Good Talk. Um, congratulations on that. I can't wait to dig in further. But thanks for being here. I really appreciate it. Brett, thank you so much for making it happen. I, I really appreciate it. I, I think um, conversations are how we build our lives. And if we can do it better, the world can be a better place. True story. So I hope people can take some stuff from this and, and make a difference in their in their work. Absolutely. I think they will. Thanks again. Thank you, brother. All right, folks, that's all for that conversation with Daniel Stillman. I hope you took away as much as I did from that talk, especially that last quote, really good stuff. So I think you should check out Daniel's book, Good Talk on Amazon and check out his site, theconversationfactory.com for more resources and even Daniel's podcast. If you have a moment to rate our show or leave a review where you listen to your podcasts, we'd really greatly appreciate it. Thanks so much for joining me and I'll see you back here for our next episode. Oh,